So I'm, I'm going to do a couple of different things uh, this evening. I'm going to uh, begin by offering uh, a very brief story, by telling a quick story, um, that will hopefully give you a sense of the uh, kind of dimensions of the research that I'm doing, the book project that I'm currently working on in earnest. It's a couple chapters away from being done. Um, and then I'm going to shift gears and launch into a more formal uh, kind of lecture talk that's the product of some new research that's also based on a much longer story that I'm going to tell. So there's two stories. Um, so just bear with me for a moment for some necessary preliminaries. So the first story I want to tell uh, begins with a rogue stockbroker named D.C. Williams who was at one time among the most notorious wiretappers in the United States. Williams made his name by tapping into the electronic communications of several prominent business entities based in the state of California, intercepting secrets about board decisions and financial performance. Williams then relayed that information to a group of paying subscribers scattered around the country, who in turn made financial moves based on the inside information that Williams had overheard. The genius of Williams' scheme wasn't just that it allowed him to eavesdrop on confidential conversations undetected. It also quite smartly capitalized on the time it takes to send an electronic message across a region as vast as that of the continental United States. And this is a short period of time, of course, uh, but a period of time nonetheless. Using highly sophisticated equipment, Williams found a way to communicate with his syndicate while slowing the speed with which the very same information uh, that he had overheard reached all destinations east of the state of California. His subscribers could buy and sell stocks moments before anyone else on the East Coast, taking advantage of illegal tips, all while appearing to go along with the daily fluctuations of the stock market. The scheme, as you might expect, uh, proved quite lucrative. Williams' correspondence, uh, which was later confiscated by authorities, revealed that the members of his syndicate had made a small fortune in the short time the conspiracy was up and running. But the setup, as you also might expect, uh, proved too good to be true. Acting on inside information of their own, authorities nabbed Williams in the act of tapping the corporate network. He was soon convicted and sent to prison under a stringent, if obscure, California state statute prohibiting the interception of electronic messages. Reporters covering the story deemed it a, quote, new chapter in crime, a reminder that eavesdropping was an inevitable byproduct of the age of electronic communications. And the year, and here is, of course, the punchline to the story, was 1864. So I first stumbled onto uh, D.C. Williams' case while researching my first book uh, in a short article that was buried in the columns of a 19th century newspaper. And reading it induced an eerie sort of historical vertigo. Williams was tapping telegraph messages, of course, not telephone exchanges or digital communications. And the stringent California state statute under which he was eventually prosecuted had been written in 1862, just two years prior, which means that wiretapping was common enough then in the Golden State uh, for lawmakers to enact a prohibition against the practice in the middle of the American Civil War. In short, wiretapping and electronic eavesdropping, those resolutely contemporary problems made newly urgent in the age of Edward Snowden's NSA, are actually as old as electronic communications themselves. So now the book I'm currently working on takes this some, uh, somewhat inconvenient truth of media history as its effective point of departure, examining the long history of wiretapping in the United States from the mid-19th century to the very near present. And the book tells two main stories. Uh, the first concerns technologies and laws, uh, the development of eavesdropping devices on uh, one hand and the statutes that policymakers have over time written to control them, uh, mostly it should be said in vain, uh, on the other hand. And the second story that the book tells is a story about culture. I'm a cultural historian, uh, not a legal historian. Uh, uh, and this is a story, a cultural story, about earlier generations confronting messy technological realities, familiar technological problems that we're still struggling to come to terms with today. And in telling these two interwoven stories, I, I try to show how public perception of the wiretap transformed over time, 
from uh, early on a technological trick associated with vice, criminality, and labor exploitation to a commonly accepted, if at times politically embattled, law enforcement tool. My central argument is that wiretapping is, and very likely always has been, a constitutive element of America's communications ecosystem. In a society in which information needs to travel across vast distances, in a society in which media technologies of all sorts enable cultural data to traverse them, the privacy of communications, I argue, is at best a public fiction. So my topic here this evening, I'm not going to cover all of the history of wiretapping despite the billing. Um, that would be a, a very long talk indeed. Uh, my, my topic here this evening is, is going to be uh, uh, the history of wiretapping for American national security, uh, a history that over time has uh, played a highly visible, uh, some might even say outsized role uh, in political debates about the practice of wiretapping. So the turn of phrase national security has a number of different meanings, both legal and cultural. And there are a number of historical genealogies and legal genealogies that one could follow in order to understand their import and function today. And here I should also say that I'm setting aside the fact that understandings of national security, of course, depend on the nation one is securing. Uh, and I'm sure the story of the concept here in Australia uh, uh, differs from the story in the United States. And I'm, I'm really curious to hear about that perhaps in our discussion uh, afterwards. In any event, that said, by all accounts, uh, the most important date in the history of national security wiretapping in the US, the subject to which I'm going to limit myself for this talk, is 1978, which is when uh, a bipartisan effort in Congress yielded the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act popularly known as FISA. This is a word that you may have heard uh, if you're following uh, the American news, as many of us are uh, um, uh, uh, lately, FISA, FISA. Uh, this was a law that authorized US government agencies to use both physical and electronic surveillance in federal terrorism and espionage investigations. Somewhat more controversially, FISA also prescribed a special set of legal protocols for obtaining the authorization necessary to conduct foreign surveillance activities. The immediate result of the FISA resolution in 1978, we now know, was the creation of a kind of shadow system of judicial oversight for national security wiretapping, a system that still to this day largely op operates outside of public scrutiny and control. So if you're anything like me, you first heard the name FISA in the months following Edward Snowden's notorious document leak in the summer of 2013. All of the kind of uh, NSA uh, uh, wiretapping and eavesdropping programs that he, was, uh, uh, he had disclosed were all operating under this kind of shadowy law, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. However, the official practice of national security wiretapping, that shadowy domain of FISA, long predates the passage of the 1978 law that gives the current system its name. In the United States, wiretapping has in fact been entangled with national security considerations at least since World War I. And perhaps the most noteworthy and strange thing about the extended period between World War I and 1978 is that American lawmakers tended to invoke the term national security to argue for the prohibition of government wiretapping programs just as often as they did to argue for their expansion. For example, the first federal law banning the practice of wiretapping in the United States was passed in 1918 as a temporary measure to protect the sanctity of the nation's communications infrastructure, which was then considered a vital area of wartime security. Similarly, in the months following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the start of World War II, attempts to grant US defense agencies wiretap authority were actually thwarted by lawmakers and civil liberties activists who believed that the only way to ensure American national security in the fight against fascism was to root out wiretapping in all of its forms, both official on the part of law enforcement agencies, uh, which was then common, and also unofficial wiretapping on the part of private individuals, uh, which was then even more so. So this tangled and from our contemporary vantage point somewhat paradoxical relationship began to change in the early 1950s when for the first time in the century-long history of the practice of wiretapping, 
American lawmakers openly began to use national security considerations as grounds for relaxing legal controls on the government's ability to eavesdrop. In this period, the telephone tap became a tool in the, de in the defense of national security rather than a weapon used by enemies of the state against it. And yet even then, even then, at the height of the Cold War, the US government's position didn't go unchallenged and the legality of national security wiretapping remained in limbo for the better part of the next three decades. So as I hope to demonstrate here today, uh, the controversies over national security surveillance that captured the nation's attention in this period were primarily the result of one obscure law, the 1934 Federal Communications Act, and a sensational federal espionage case that exposed that law's destructive ambiguities. United States v. Judith Copeland of 1949-1950. Taking a close look at the issue of national security wiretapping in this transitional period shows us that the American surveillance state, so-called, was by no means monolithic or even coherent at the moment of its apparent origin. Although Americans tend to remember the Cold War as a period of intensified government eavesdropping, the reality on the ground, as I hope to show here, was much, much messier. And attending to these historical instabilities, I think, reveals just how drastically the parameters of our public conversation about electronic eavesdropping have shifted over time. And this is an issue that I'm going to discuss in closing. Uh, but in the interest of time, uh, I'm just going to jump right into my second story, the main story of my talk here today. So for more than two and a half decades, the history of wiretapping and electronic eavesdropping in the United States hinged on one word written and codified in an obscure federal statute. The word confounded government officials who were wary of wiretapping, and it infuriated civil liberties advocates who wanted to see the practice abolished. The word emboldened and later embarrassed the FBI's clandestine effort to use wiretaps in criminal cases and espionage investigations. The word led to confusion, acrimony, and impassioned debate, eventually hastening a series of public scandals that captured the nation's attention in the early years of the Cold War. And the word that caused all of the trouble was and. <laughs> in 1934, Congress passed the Federal Communications Act, or FCA, a landmark law designed to regulate the advances in telegraphy, telephony, and radio that had reshaped America's communications industries in the years following World War I. Now, the stated aims of the FCA were administrative, but buried in Section 605 of the, statute, of the law excuse me, were a series of seemingly innocuous provisions reproduced in their entirety on the screen behind me. Uh, now, I won't read uh, the entire statute through, I won't bore you with that, uh, but uh, suffice it to say, even a cursory gl glance at the legalese uh, will underscore just how easy it would have been for lawmakers to misconstrue, or worse yet, overlook the statute's crucial second clause. No person not being authorized by the sender shall intercept any communication and divulge or publish the existence, contents, purport, effect, or meaning of such intercepted communication to any other person. So if you're reading closely, uh, herein lies something of a problem. So there are at least two ways to interpret the second clause of section 605, and your view of the story that follows will likely depend on the interpretation you favor. On one hand, it's possible to read the provision as a wiretapping ban. In effect, this is to read the and in the crucial intercept and divulge formulation somewhat generously as an or, which would imply that Congress intended to represent the interception and divulgence of private communications as independent acts, each equally prohibited in the eyes of the law. Uh, in this interpretation of section 605, tapping a wire is a federal crime, and so is the public disclosure of wiretapped information. Sounds good, right? On the other hand, it's possible to read the and in intercept and divulge much more literally as a conjunction stipulating that both acts, both interception and divulgence, need to occur for anything illegal to have taken place. In this alternative interpretation, an equally plausible if somewhat literal-minded interpretation, 
Section 605 functions solely as a prohibition against the disclosure of wiretapped communications in a public venue, such as a criminal trial or a newspaper column, not as a prohibition against the act of wiretapping in and of itself. Here, the statute serves more as a rule of decorum rather than a strict legal prohibition. Wiretapping is forbidden if and only if the contents of a wiretapped conversation are disclosed or made public. And quite obviously, this interpretation uh, calls into question the statute's force as a wiretapping ban. So which was it? Was wiretapping illegal following the passage of the FCA, or was it merely that the divulgence of wiretapped information was illegal? What did the and in intercept and divulge really mean? So somewhat inconveniently, no one bothered to ask that crucial question, these crucial questions, when the FCA became law in 1934. There is little in the congressional record to suggest that government officials gave sustained attention to the language of Section 605 while the FCA was up for debate. And the statute, in fact, received nothing in the way of public notice in the years following the bill's passage. However, in the late 1930s, an interpretation of the intercept and divulge clause proved pivotal in two US Supreme Court cases involving one of the largest bootlegging syndicates uh, in the United States to survive the fall of the prohibition of alcohol. The first case, Nardone v. United States of 1937, or Nardone I in the shorthand of legal historians, ruled that the, quote, plain mandate of Section 605 was to prohibit the divulgence of wiretap conversations either in a court of law or in any other public venue. The majority opinion in the ruling notably stopped short of specifying whether the law also prohibited the bare act of interception in and of itself. But any doubts about the scope of the statute that lingered after Nardone I seemed to disappear two years later when the court handed down a second ruling in the case of Nardone v. United States in 1939. And this ruling prohibited the divulgence or use of evidence gathered even indirectly from wiretapping. Crucially, the second Nardone decision, uh, which then became known as Nardone II, explicitly condemned the act of interception as a, quote, grave wrong over and against the act of divulgence. And in the earliest known use of a designation that would become notorious in the history of American criminal procedure, the majority opinion in Nardone II also characterized evidence gleaned from wiretaps as, quote, fruit of the poisonous tree. Fruit of the poisonous tree. This is probably in the law school, of course, a turn of phrase that you've heard before. After Nardone II, few could question which part of the intercept and divulge provision carried the poison. By 1940, then, there was very little uncertainty about the US Supreme Court's stance on government wiretapping. Whatever the exact doctrinal significance of the Nardone rulings, it was clear that after decades of begrudgingly turning a blind eye to wiretapping, the court had suddenly moved to deter the practice through the red tape of criminal procedure. Yet even as government agencies scrambled to conform to a more superficially restrictive legal regime, the ground was shifting. Behind closed doors, officials at the Justice Department and the FBI were working to minimize the effect of the Nardone precedents. Deliberately concealed and chillingly cynical, I think, their efforts to reframe the Supreme Court's decisions blunted the force of Section 605 until the FCA was effectively rendered useless. So how does this happen? The historian Athan Theo Harris's research on classified FBI documents helps to illuminate the origins of the government's effort, efforts on this front uh, during the late 1930s and early 1940s. According to Theo Harris, government officials first began toying with the second alternative reading of Section 605, the more literal-minded reading of Section 605, in direct response to Nardone I. On December 22, 1937, just two days after the court handed down its decision, FBI and Assistant Director Edward Tam sent a confidential uh, memorandum to J. Edward, J. Edgar Hoover, excuse me, uh, the Bureau's notorious longtime director, urging Hoover not to, quote, misinterpret the Supreme Court's construction of Section 605. In Tam's view, Nardone I wasn't actually intended to curb wiretapping at all. The ruling prohibited, quote, intercepting and divulging or publishing, 
he reasoned, not interception or divulgence. In theory, this meant that the FBI could maintain its wiretap authority as long as the contents of the messages they intercepted went undisclosed. Now, Tam's logic was shaky and perhaps even mendacious. Certainly, a government wiretapper would, as a matter of course, have to divulge the conversations he overheard to his colleagues or superiors to further any ongoing federal investigation. But logistical contradictions notwithstanding, Hoover was sold. He liked this uh, uh, idea. Uh, a week later, he sent a letter containing the following instructions to the agents in charge of the FBI's local field offices. Quote, no phone taps without my approval, and as previously, we will not authorize any except in extraordinary cases, and then not to obtain evidence, but only for collateral leads, only for collateral leads. So Nardone, too, of course, abrogated uh, Hoover's instructions two years later, since it prohibited even the use of collateral leads uh, gleaned from wiretaps. And in accordance with the new Supreme Court precedent, uh, then U.S. Attorney General Robert Jackson issued an order banning all wiretaps in the government shortly after he took office uh, in 1940. The practice would have likely waned if the president himself hadn't then taken an extraordinary step to intervene. Uh, in a confidential memorandum to Jackson dated May 21st, 1940, uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt encouraged Jackson to reverse his internal ban and granted the Justice Department executive authority to use wiretaps in national security cases. Quote, I have agreed with the broad purposes of the Supreme Court decision relating to wiretapping in investigations, Roosevelt conceded to Jackson, referring to the shift in policy that Nardone too had signaled. The court is undoubtedly sound in its uh, both in its regard to the use of evidence secured over tapped wires in the prosecution of citizens in criminal cases, and is also right in its opinion that under ordinary and normal circumstances, wiretapping should not be carried out for the excellent reason that it is almost always bound to lead to the abuse of civil rights. But, Roosevelt continued, <laughs> it's an important but, uh, in hindering the government's ability to tap in national security cases, the court had perilously overstepped its bounds. And Roosevelt closed the memorandum by claiming that threats of espionage, sabotage, and what he called fifth column activities, uh, the most pressing, pressing uh, national security issues of that day, uh, were prevalent enough to carve out an executive exception to the Nardone rules. And he informed Jackson that the FBI was, quote, at liberty to secure the communications of persons suspected of subversive activities against the government of the United States, including suspected spies. So Roosevelt's secret directive to permit FBI wiretapping, what later became known as the Roosevelt Doctrine, uh, was a swift and decisive blow to the Supreme Court's decisions in Nardone 1 and 2. All the more astonishing is the fact that it went into effect amid widespread public debate about the ethics and extent of government wiretapping itself. Roosevelt sent his memorandum to Jackson on the very same day that members of the Senate Committee on Interstate Commerce held the first in a series of high-profile hearings on the tapping and blackmail of state politicians in New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. And perhaps more strikingly, when Congress began, began debating emergency proposals for wiretap reform in the months following the Pearl Harbor attack, both Hoover and Roosevelt offered public statements in support of legal policies designed to authorize government wiretapping in national security investigations. Neither of them, neither Hoover nor Roosevelt, uh, offered uh, uh, so much as, excuse me, neither of them, neither uh, Hoover nor Roosevelt, so much as hinted that a, such a policy was already in place. And in hindsight, I think the contradiction is almost breathtaking. While members of Congress debated the implications of annulling the Nardone decisions for wartime, representatives of the Justice Department and the FBI and even the President himself contributed to the hearings knowing full well that the Nardone decisions were already in effect annulled. Thus, a secret and possibly illegal government wiretapping policy was born, a policy derived from a somewhat strained reading of legal language a policy adopted in flagrant disregard for judicial precedent, and a policy hidden in plain sight from the American public. 
Following the President's confidential memorandum of May 1940, wiretaps were permitted at the Justice Department and the FBI when approved by the Attorney General. And after the war, as Theo Harris has also shown, Hoover made yet another move, a somewhat insidious move, to expand the Bureau's wiretap authority. In a July 1946 letter to President Harry Truman, uh, uh, Roosevelt's successor, uh, Attorney General Thomas Clark informed the Truman administration of Roosevelt's secret policy, the Roosevelt Doctrine, and asked for its renewal in cases, uh, as Clark wrote, vitally affecting the domestic security or where human life is in jeopardy. To add weight to his appeal, Clark included a portion of Roosevelt's secret memorandum in the letter. But at Hoover's suggestion, uh, he excised the final sentence of the original document, ordering the FBI to limit its wiretapping activities to those involving, quote, alien security threats. Truman signed off on the letter wholly unaware that he was giving the Bureau a much longer leash. Ironically, one of the most valuable FBI targets to emerge in the years following the renewal of the Roosevelt Doctrine was a government employee, a Justice, Justice Department employee. Her name was Judith Copeland, a 27-year-old analyst in the Justice Department's Foreign Agents and Registration Section uh, who came to be suspected of spying for the Soviet Union in 1948. Along with Alger Hiss, Klaus Fuchs, and Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, all of whom were brought to trial in the same period, Copeland remains synonymous with the US government's efforts, efforts to combat espionage in the early years of the Cold War. She's also somewhat notably the first Soviet spy known to have been identified on the basis of decrypted KGB cable messages, uh, a fact that wasn't revealed until 1986 when one of the principal players in the US government's uh, Venona Project, a, a top secret US Army code breaking program, uh, published a tell-all memoir. So despite uh, Copeland's renown, historians have long overlooked the significance of her case to the evolution of US wiretapping policy, particularly national security wiretapping. Copeland's convictions for espionage and conspiracy in 1949-1950, uh, both of which were eventually overturned on procedural technicalities, as we'll soon see, uh, these, offered, these cases offered the nation its first glimpse of the government surveillance activities that had become routine under the Roosevelt Doctrine. But Copeland's case did more than simply reveal what was otherwise hidden. As the star player in a drama that paradoxically cast her as both perpetrator and victim, an, illegally spy, an illegal spy illegally spied on, Copeland served as a human touchstone for the volatile debate over national security wiretapping in the years that followed, the early years of the Cold War. Uh, during the 1950s, Copeland, uh, during the 1950s, Sorry, I've lost my place here. Um, uh, civil liberty activists who protested uh, the FBI's uh, surveillance programs uh, often uh, did so in her name, in Copeland's name. And likewise, uh, government officials who advocated for wiretap authorization openly attempted to exploit the public outcry over her botched convictions. In short, the struggle over Judith Copeland was nothing less than a contest over the future of communications privacy in the United States and her cases appeared to bring Section 605 to its breaking point. So a little about uh, Judith Copeland. Uh, Copeland was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1921, uh, the daughter of a toy maker and a milliner. A promising student from an early age, Copeland went on to attend Barnard College in New York, uh, where she majored in history and served as an editor for the student newspaper, the Barnard Bulletin. Despite her fleeting involvement with a chapter of the Young Communist League on campus, and despite penning several left-leaning columns for the bulletin throughout her tenure as an undergraduate, Copeland secured a job in the New York office of the Justice Department's Economic Warfare uh, section shortly after she graduated from Barnard in 1943. Sometime in the fall of 1944, a KGB agent recruited her to the Soviet cause. Within months, her value as an intelligence asset escalated when she was promoted to a position with security clearance at the Justice Department's headquarters in Washington, DC. For the better part of the next four years, 
Copeland's job allowed her to supply detailed information to the KGB about the FBI's uh, domestic counterintelligence activities. KGB reports, uh, decoded by the Venona Project and declassified decades later, praised Copeland as a, quote, very serious, modest, thoughtful young woman who is ideologically close to us. Another Soviet cable noted that she, quote, treats our assignments very seriously and conscientiously and considers our work the main job in her life. In short, she was a spy. Um, it was through Venona that Copeland first came to the attention of federal authorities. The discovery prompted an elaborate, uh, a very elaborate FBI investigation that involved round-the-clock electronic surveillance, physical surveillance on Copeland's frequent trips from Washington to visit her family in New York, a false Justice Department document fed to Copeland to bait her into action, and famously, on the night of March 4th, 1949, a dramatic pursuit of Copeland and the man who turned out to be her Soviet contact through the New York City subway system. When Copeland was finally arrested and questioned, and she was uh, arrested and questioned without a warrant, I want you to keep this detail in mind, um, investigators discovered a cache of government documents folded neatly in her purse, and the, pur the purpose of her trip to New York was, obvious, was quite obvious. Copeland was soon booked on a litany of espionage and conspiracy charges in both Washington and New York, a confusing legal arrangement that forced the government to put her on trial in two separate jurisdictions over the spring of 1949 and the winter of 1949-1950. In the Washington trial, the first trial, an affair that had a circus-like aura from start to finish, Copeland's lead defense counsel, an attorney named Archie Palmer, uh, repeatedly insinuated that the FBI had established its case against Copeland on the basis of an illegal wiretapping operation. But when Palmer confronted the investigating officers on the stand about the possible use of electronic surveillance, all of them testified under oath that they had, quote, no knowledge of any such activity on the part of the Bureau. The prosecution's case in Washington was otherwise open and shut, and Copeland was easily convicted. Copeland's defense team pushed harder on the wiretap angle when the scene shifted to New York in December 1950. In the preliminary hearings of the second trial, the dam of secrecy broke. Over the course of six momentous weeks, the presiding judge in New York compelled the prosecution to submit, to submit a damaging series of affidavits that disclosed the existence of an extensive FBI wiretapping operation on Copeland. From January 6th, 1949 to September 27, 1949, dates that spanned the opening of the Copeland investigation, the period immediately following her arrest, and even the early phases of her first trial in Washington. The FBI actively maintained a tap on Copeland's home telephone, a tap on Copeland's office telephone, even though she didn't work there anymore, uh, and a tap on the home telephone of Copeland's parents. And on the screen behind me, uh, you'll see the internal memorandum that authorized the FBI plant the latter tap. Official documents that I was able to uncover through a Freedom of Information Act uh, request uh, also revealed that investigators routinely monitored a microphone hidden in Copeland's desk at the Justice Department uh, and the web of what the FBI euphemistically in those days called technical surveillance even seems to have extended to Copeland's friends and colleagues, giving the investigation the appearance of a kind of dragnet fishing expedition. In total, 96 federal agents in Washington and New York were involved in the wiretap operation, all with the approval of the U.S. Attorney General, whose initials, uh, TCC for Thomas Campbell Clark, you'll notice on the right-hand side of the classified document uh, that you see before you. The FBI's eavesdropping campaign in the Copeland case was, however, unusual, both in terms of its size and in terms of its disregard for bureaucratic protocol, as we'll soon see. And the revelations of its existence cast the pall of perjury over Copeland's first conviction in Washington. As the New York hearings wore on, the details of bureau misconduct only worsened. Testimony in the early days of, of January 1950 revealed that among the hundreds of telephone conversations that the FBI had intercepted over the course of the investigation, 14 were between Copeland and her lawyer, Archie Palmer, 
a flagrant violation of attorney-client privilege that occurred as her first trial was just getting underway. And on January 12, 1950, a last-minute round of affidavits disclosed the existence of an internal FBI memorandum filed on the eve of Copeland's second trial, ordering the destruction of all records pertaining to the Copeland eavesdropping operation. The Tiger Memo, as the document came to be known, appeared to suggest that the Bureau was actively working to conceal the source of its proof against Copeland, all in the hopes of avoiding complications in the New York trial. The stain of illegality seemed to go all the way up the chain at the Justice Department. Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, uh, the director of the FBI, notorious director, is in fact the H who signs OK at the bottom of the facsimile of the Tiger Memo you see here, effectively greenlighting the destruction of key records in the case. So all told, the hearings exposed a disquieting, to say the least, pattern of wiretap activity at the FBI. Dirty business conducted to bolster the prosecution's case, ensure a high-profile conviction, and possibly, just possibly, thwart judicial inquiry. And yet, the New York trial pressed on. In accordance with the rules of evidence established in the Nardone decisions, remember those, the government su successfully persuaded the court that the FBI had obtained the vital part of its proof against Copeland, completely independent of the disastrous, now disastrous wiretap operation. The intercepted conversations, the violations of attorney-client privilege, the destruction of key records, all were deemed beyond the scope of the proceedings. And for a second time, Copeland was convicted and sent to prison. The difference, however, was that it was now impossible to ignore how she had arrived there. The most prominent figure to step forward and cry foul was one James Lawrence Fly, a high-profile New York attorney then serving as the director of the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU. Tall, lanky, and notoriously quick-tempered, Fly had spent a tumultuous five-year stint in Washington as chairman of the Federal Communications Commission from 1939 to 1944. Much of his early work for the FCC involved forcing recalcitrant federal agencies to conform to the new Nardone decisions. And over time, the frustrations of the job drove him to wage a public crusade against government wiretapping that occasionally bordered on zealotry. Convinced that Section 605 was key to protecting, quote, the integrity of our entire scheme of communications, as he put it in a March 1941 letter to President Roosevelt, Fly first drew the ire of the American intelligence establishment by blocking a wartime law that would have granted the federal government emergency wiretapping authority. Fly left Washington at the end of World War II, uh, a decision in part necessitated by a vicious M FBI smear campaign. Uh, but during the late 1940s, Fly so often pestered federal officials about Section 605 that many would joke that he took pains to live up to his name. A joke. Uh, it's, it's a true, it's true. It's, uh, above all else, the Copeland ordeal confirmed Fly's belief that lax enforcement of the Federal Communications Act had encouraged widespread wiretap abuse in Washington. On the eve of Copeland's second trial, Fly wrote an urgent letter to U.S. Attorney General H uh, J. Howard McGrath to implore the Justice Department to probe the FBI's, quote, extensive record of wiretap activity in cases like Copeland's. When McGrath refused to, dignifies Fly, to dignify Fly's charges, Fly unleashed a furious torrent of editorials and petitions in an attempt to pressure the federal government to acknowledge its, mis its misdeeds. Now, unfortunately, I don't have time here to delve into Fly's fascinating and daring uh, civil liberties crusade, which I was able to reconstruct through work with his manuscripts at Columbia Universities, but, uh, University, but just to give you a sense of the lengths to which he went to agitate on Copeland's behalf during this period. Uh, one particularly characteristic effort involved him filing an actual lawsuit against AT&T, Bell Telephone, uh, for overcharging his phone bill. Uh, and Fly's reasoning, uh, which was captured in an actual civil filing that he handed in, 
uh, uh, in New York, uh, was that since the FBI was clearly in the business of listening to the conversations of ordinary Americans on the telephone, uh, subscribers like him were actually entitled to pay party line rates. Um, and he, he, he lost. He lost this uh, civil. This is an actual. I mean, a, I've seen the the document. It's, a, it's an amazing tongue-in-cheek document, but he was actually uh, somewhat serious, dead serious, in fact. If Fly's efforts uh, to raise awareness of government wiretap abuse seem reckless or even quixotic in the context of a Cold War climate hostile to political dissent, it's worth noting that his charges against the FBI found a welcome audience in the early months of 1950, while Copeland was on trial. When Fly circulated a petition to investigate Hoover for civil liberties abuses in the Copeland case, for instance, hundreds of prominent Americans signed on, uh, attorneys in New York, lawmakers in Washington, and even former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, the widow of the president whose secret wiretap policy was suddenly at the center of the scandal. While many of Fly's petitioners recognized the need to continue uh, prosecuting Copeland for espionage, if the Copeland cal is guilty, I want her punished, Fly underscored in a uh, February uh, 1950 letter, uh, the Bureau's crimes nonetheless seemed grave enough to take a stand in the woman's name. Perhaps more importantly, Fly's crusade against the FBI paved the way for Copeland's bid to overturn her New York conviction an effort that ended up having massive implications for the debate over government wiretapping in the early years of the Cold War. In October 1950, Copeland submitted an official appeal to New York's Second Circuit Court. And three months later, Judge Learned Hand, a famous, uh, um, a famous name in the history of American jurisprudence, uh, he's, uh, not just because he's named Learned Hand. Um, uh, three months later, uh, Judge Hand made the controversial decision to invalidate the results of the trial. Despite conceding, uh, in his opinion, uh, that Copeland's, quote, guilt is plain, Hand's 7,000-word opinion, an extraordinary document, uh, seldom consulted in the history of US wiretap law, held that the FBI's initial arrest and search of Copeland provided reasonable grounds to overturn her conviction. Recall uh, that she was arrested and searched without a court-issued warrant. Crucial detail. Uh, but also crucially, on top of his argument about the warrantless arrest, Hand argued that the presiding judge in New York was actually justified in his initial ruling that the issue of illegal wiretapping was relevant to the case. In an attempt to drive home this point, he concluded the opinion by distinguishing a decision, his decision from a referendum on federal wiretap policy. Perhaps, Hand's final lines read, the powers of the Bureau to arrest without warrant should be broadened, and perhaps it would be desirable to set limits to the immunity from wiretapping of those who are shown by independent evidence to be probably engaged in crime. However, Hand continued, all of these matters are matters with which we have no power to deal and on which we express no opinion. We take the law as we find it, and under it, the conviction cannot stand. The government didn't officially drop the charges against Copeland, who then walked free until 1967. Now, it's hard to overstate the significance of Hand's reasoning, especially because it has become commonplace, all too commonplace, for historians to claim that Copeland's judicial victory was the direct result of an illegal wiretapping operation. This is what everyone thinks. Uh, to be sure, the Tiger revelations fanned the flames of an ongoing public debate over the federal government's use and abuse of electronic surveillance. But the muddy legal history of federal law enforcement wiretapping from Section 605 to the Nardone rulings, and from the Nardone rulings to the Roosevelt Doctrine. This merely proved to be an ancillary consideration in the final decision on Copeland's appeal. To this point, Hand never once questioned the legality of the FBI's wiretap operation in his 7,000-word opinion on the case. And the intercept and divulge clause isn't mentioned at all. In short, Copeland walked free because of an illegal arrest. She didn't walk free because of illegal wiretapping. Why then do the myths surrounding the Copeland case persist? Why do so many historians tell her story inaccurately? Beyond the persistence of the myth that Cold War surveillance practices were totalizing and unopposed, a myth that I'll return to here in closing, 
My sense is that the answers to these questions lie in the messy aftermath to the case. Linking Copeland's freedom to both Section 605 and the Nardone rules, in fact, emerged as a crucial aspect of the federal government's strategy to legalize government wiretapping for national security in the years that followed. Within weeks of Han's decision, lawmakers who favored wiretap authorization began working to capitalize on the outrage surrounding the appeal. Their efforts ended up amounting to little in terms of concrete policy change, but they solidified the narrative still widely held today that Copeland's victory was the product of a loophole in federal wiretap policy. For example, New York Congressman Kenneth Keating, a longtime phone tapping advocate, responded to the Copeland decision by immediately calling for the legalization of all government wiretapping. According to Keating, Han's decision was a, quote, absurd and dangerous precedent, one that protected the rights of known spies at the expense of the government's war on espionage. Hoover himself sent a misleading memorandum to the Attorney General in 1951, similarly claiming that the outcome of the Copeland case had the potential to stymie the FBI's anti-communist crusade. Quote, without legislation modifying the effect of Section 605 of the Communications Act of 1934, he complained, allegations will be made, as in the Copeland case, that this bureau is engaging in illegal practices. Top brass at the Department of Justice agreed, and they soon turned to Keating to help propose a new federal law giving the, the government the right to tap in national security investigations. By spring of 1953, Hoover and Keating's back channeling began to yield dividends when four new wiretapping proposals reached the floor of the House of Representatives for debate. Three of the bills proposed giving the FBI and other government agencies national security wiretap authority, essentially codifying Roosevelt's informal policy of the 1940s. The fourth bill, known as H.R. 5149, went in a much more radical direction proposing an outright appeal of Section 605 and offering a blank check to the FBI in its wiretapping operations. Controversially, the bill also contained what was known as a retroactive clause that would have allowed the government to reopen federal cases involving wiretapped evidence that had been shelved or even overturned as a result of the Nardone rules. That Copeland was the target of the House's legislative push in 1953 was by no means kept secret. In his opening statement in the hearings on the proposed legislation, Keating brazenly claimed that loopholes in federal wiretapping policy had allowed Copeland to win her appeal. Quote, the laws and court decisions affecting national security wiretapping have left the whole situation in a hopeless muddle. A problem, Keating continued, brought out, by, brought out dramatically in the trial of one Judith Copeland, who won her appeal to a large extent because Section 605 of the Federal Communications Act is so vague and unsatisfactory. If we are to cope successfully with the menace spies present, Keating concluded, we must untie the hands of those who are charged with the responsibility of apprehending them. Again, and, uh, the resonances, and I haven't really been pointing them out, but the resonances between then and now uh, abound, particularly because uh, Keating's account of what was at stake was patently false. Uh, legally speaking, Copeland's victory had nothing to do with Section 605, yet in the months and even years that followed, lawmakers in favor of wiretap authorization opportunistically proceeded as if it did. The House's so-called wiretapping for national security resolution passed with slight revisions in 1953. Um, everything was included in the bill except for the retroactive clause. But it faced an uphill battle in a more progressive Senate the following year. Copeland again loomed large over the public hearings on the proposed legislation. And ex experts like our friend James Lawrence Fly, who testified on the floor of the Senate while waving a bound copy of Learned Hand's opinion above his head. Uh, Fly pointed out that the Justice Department's case for wiretap authorization was the product of selective memory. The bill never ended up passing. And by 1955, advocates of national security wiretapping began throwing up their hands in frustration. Let us not delude ourselves any longer, U.S. Attorney General Herbert Brownell pleaded on the heels of the bill's defeat. We might, as ju we might just as well face up to the fact that, that the communists are subversives and conspirators working fanatically in the interests of a hostile foreign power. If we are to be safe, 
the wires of America must cease being a protection, protected communication system for the enemies of America. Wiretap advocates, however, like Bar Brownell, had to wait another two decades before the tide even began to turn. So what can we learn from the Copeland affair and its aftermath? Uh, and more generally, uh, what can we learn from the essential belatedness of national security wiretap authorization in the United States? So I'll be brief here, uh, since I'm fairly certain that my time is running short, but I think there are two main points that are worth highlighting here in closing. The first point is that the explosive debates about national security power that resulted from the Copeland case actually ended up further solidifying the practice of wiretapping as a violation of civil liberties, rather than normalizing it as a routine investigative tactic, a fact that generally runs counter to our memory of the post-war Cold War period as one of intensified government surveillance in the United States. It's important to note uh, that despite the upheaval that Copeland's judicial victory caused, and despite the Justice Department's hollow attempts to capitalize on it, Congress passed no laws authorizing national security wiretapping in the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s. Again, it's not until 1978 that this happens. And while the FBI regularly undertook electronic surveillance projects during this period, indeed, its black record of abuse against suspected sus spies and subversives and civil rights activists is quite well known, the numbers actually su suggest that the Bureau's wiretapping activities during the 1950s in the opening acts of the Cold War were under far more stringent legal and administrative controls than they were in the years following the adoption of, Roosevelt, of the Roosevelt Doctrine a decade prior. If the data is any accurate measure, the number of reported FBI wiretaps declined precipitously over the course of the 1950s and into the 1960s, and the Bureau's use of electronic listening devices, or BUGS, followed a similar trend line. In 1967, the FBI actually reported that it had com completely abandoned using concealed, concealed microphones in its investigative activities. The lion's share of the business of bugging in this period, a billion dollar industry by some estimates, actually happened outside of government channels in the private sector. Um, that's another story for another time. Uh, the point here is that the FBI's stepping up of electronic surveillance during the early years of the Cold War is perhaps, just perhaps, more myth than reality. And this brings me to a second thread that's worth pulling on here briefly in closing. One of the things that I think is truly striking in reading the debates about Copeland's case today, aside from the kind of human scale it gives to the often anonymous and faceless story of state surveillance, is just how completely a prohibitive stance against government wiretapping prevailed in the United States at mid-century. The decades following the passage of the Federal Communications Act of 1934 generally mark a period in which wiretapping was condemned, both legally and culturally, as an egregious violation of civil liberties. The restrictive, if somewhat ambiguous, regime of Section 605 didn't, in fact, begin to erode until the late 1960s and early 1970s, uh, uh, a shift that ultimately gave us FISA in 1978. Now, I don't think it's a generalization to say that we now appear to live in a far more permissive age when it comes to electronic surveillance. Today, uh, lawmakers and political pundits generally understand national security wiretapping either to be an indispensable tool or a necessary evil, depending on where one lies on the political spectrum. But the prohibitive stance against wiretapping that was once so central to American political culture, mainstream American political culture, has over time been pushed to the margins. And I think in these dark days, it's probably worth remembering that it wasn't always thus. Thanks for listening.